My name is Steve White. My call is NU0P, and I've been licensed since 1962. So I've been doing this for quite a while. I didn't have any mentor. I lived in the country. And so I had to learn whatever I learned all by myself. I had to go find a guy to give me a novice test. So the guy with the biggest antenna, I went to his house. And he was an avid builder. He showed me all these things that he built. One of them was a six meter regenerative receiver. And I was just amazed. And then I got to look at his SX-101A and my heart melt, melted. What a radio that was at that point in time. So my story here is not about kit building. It's about what I call real life home brewing, taking stuff that doesn't exist or it's in a handbook or somebody had a great idea and put it up on you know, the internet and uh, we started building from that. So some of you know this guy, you know, how many of us got that magazine years and years? Yeah, many of you did, I did. So this guy is W1ECCH, no club says on his badge. And uh, he never worried about anything. He had a great big soldering iron. He had a bunch of solder and he had a heath kit to put together. How good can it get, right? So um, I began looking at stuff when I was that young, but had no idea what it was. I, uh, I worked at uh, Collins Radio and I retired from Collins Radio. But don't think me an engineer, don't think me a technician. That's not the kind of work I did there. But um, I had some friends there that, that were helpful in the, in the 70s era, era. So one of the things I first built was this nice little um, audio amp. And, and this is, you know, dead bug kind of construction. It was in the handbook. And I, I don't know how many days, hours, weeks, I worked to debug this thing and make it work. Found out, bad diode. You know, and I was pretty, very young and didn't know much. And it took a long time to put that together and make it work, but I succeeded. Um, then, much later, I mean, this is now 80s or not, early 90s, this IF strip you see on the bottom, is a uh, W7ZOI uh, IF strip. Three cast coded um, uh, IF gain stages, and it works super. Keith was talking about the one that was in the, the DC receiver, the DC40 receiver. This one I think works just as well. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I started trying to figure out well, okay, I got bits and pieces of stuff to build a radio. How do I do that? What do I put it in? How do I build that magical VFO? Because those things are the key elements. So I had this old, old uh, transmitter, old Kenwood 599A transmitter. And I thought, well, maybe I can take it apart and use the parts out of it, particularly the VFO. This turns out to be an MTech transceiver board, but I didn't use their VFO. I used the one in the Kenwood. And uh, that, that radio worked swell. I really liked how that radio worked. However, not all things are the law of unintended consequences <laughs> that we know about, you know? So this transformer got a little hot, as you can see. But that wasn't the end of it. I built some stuff for cars, for my car. And it came out of the handbook. And how many of you have some of those older handbooks with the schematics there? And there's lines drawn across that each one of those parts as you put them in, in your circuit. And we all did that. Well, some of those things didn't work too well or weren't wired correctly by me. And you ended up with stuff like this, you know? <laughs> so it's scary, but uh, that can happen. So some of my favorite people, that you know these people, none of these are surprises to you, to you ZOI, QO, QO, and 6QW. If you don't know this guy, uh, Pete Giuliani, you're missing a bet here. This guy's the most prolific radio builder I know of. And not only that, he answers every single one of my, my emails to him about stuff. So those are the things that I rely on quite a bit. This is one of N6QW's designs. He must have built 30 of these kinds of things, you know, over his lifetime. 
This guy, K-A-Q-Y, uh, Jim Kirchie, came up with something called a 2N220. It was part of a contest from many years ago. And some of you probably know of this. He documented his design for this radio so well, I was able to build it from scratch. And I amazed myself that I could do that and make it work. It took a long time, but he even laid out uh, the circuit board that you can put all the parts on. He allocated space to those particular functions. Um, it was a real boon to me to be able to look at his circuit and put it on the board and make it work. And this chart here is the key to making his stuff or anybody's stuff work. So he went through the circuitry and annotated at different points what the waveform should look like, how big it should be, et cetera. I mean, it took me a year, long time to figure out how much drive do I need out of a VFO to run a mixer? I, I mean, it's not, it wasn't obvious to me at the time, but his annotations here, and this is one of many pages that he put together uh, to describe this stuff. So this is the signal at port A, VFO off. Uh, so it kind of went through the via, whole VFO thing um, and helped you. Here's the output of a mixer, obviously. Uh, so having that kind of information was enough for me to really get started because I didn't have any formal education in electronics. And how many of you guys do? How many of you guys are engineers and technicians? Let's see. See, a, a, a fair quantity of you are, but a lot of you are like me who didn't go to school for this stuff and struggle with it. And um, you can build kits is one thing, doing this kind of stuff is a whole different exercise. So after um, I did that, uh, this isn't my shop, it would be nice. Uh, this is more like what I, what I got, you know. Uh, it's a big mess, but it all worked for the most part. But I decided I needed, I thought it would be a good idea to give my club a briefing on home brewing, and I did. And out of that came a couple of people who said, oh, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And I said, well, I've got the space for this. I happen to have a, well, I'm kind of a, I shouldn't say hoarder, but I've got you know a basement with two bedrooms that are cooked together that is a shop and a, and a radio room. But then I've got a three car garage that there's no room for cars. It's a, it's a radio stuff of one kind or another. You know, how many people have, you know, six HR10Bs? I do. Oh, you got them too. Okay, good. Well, I'd like to make one good one and I'd like to add more filtering to it, IF filtering and things of that sort. And that's why I kind of collect some of that kind of stuff. But so I started a group of about three people who came over to my workshop in the garage and we began to build stuff. Um, the, we had all kinds of um, experience levels. Oops. Uh, and the first thing we built was a, was a BIDX 20. This was not today's BIDX. This was a long time ago, the original BIDXs. You had to go, you could buy a kit, came out of India, I believe it was. Uh, it was all uh, through hole kind of construction. And um, we made that work. Uh, 20 meters only. It was sideband. And the reason we did the sideband one is because half the guys in, in my little group don't know CW. So they wanted the sideband and I wanted to use what they built. I actually use it on a regular basis. Uh, so this is one flavor of it when it's all packaged up with a digital display. Here's a block diagram. I'm not gonna go through that. These are eye test charts. You know, it's, hard, it's impossible to read this stuff back there. Uh, here's the schematic, and there's a lot of stuff in there, you know? And um, I learned a tremendous amount on how to make a radio work, what kind of signal signals we should have at different places in the IF strip, where, what the signal level should be at the output of the VFO, or how to look and understand what the PA was doing, all those sorts of things. And I did it, you know, I'll call it the hard way without a lot of, edu with very little education on this stuff but just constant persistence. One of the things I've learned is the, the more mistakes I make, the faster I learn. 
And that works well for me. I don't know about the rest of you, but that uh, works great for me. Uh, here's the inside of the radio. But the one that we spent a lot of time on building was the Paraset. I'll bet you guys, I bet you most of you guys know what a Paraset is. Um, come on, change. Oh, the driver. There it is. This is a British spy radio. You guys probably know about that. It was designed in England, um, dropped in the, in the countries via agents, you know, spies, if you will, by parachute. These guys would take all of this stuff, get dropped in the country, they drop them out of a Lancaster bomber. And I'm gonna give you the story about how this radio was used a bit, because that's the thing that triggered me to wanna to go build this. These guys that did this were 20 year old kids. I call it QRP fights back, because this is a five watt radio. Here it is, this is an original. Um, I don't know if you can see very well, but there's a power supply here. Uh, the radio is here. This is an original one. The original ones came in the wooden boxes. Um, the later ones came in metal boxes, and that was because they could survive the parachute drop better. But it's the same radio. The radio is no different. I mean, it's, it's got <laughs> six V6 tubes. Um, it's got this funky little dial we're going to talk a little bit more about. So this guy, Olaf Reed Olson, wrote a book called Two Eggs on My Plate. And it is a story of how he went from Norway to England, got uh, brought into the spy community, if you will, and was sent back to Norway. He, uh, and he wanted to be a pilot, but they thought since he could speak German and Norwegian and English, he'd be better serve, serving his country going in as a spy. So here he is out in the field operating uh, the Paraset. You can see it right here. So here he is again, there's several pictures of him operating. This is called from the station on the reverse bath. I'm not exactly sure what the reverse bath is, but he's out there operating his Paraset. And I'm gonna tell you more about this. So you operate in the woods, you can kind of see the, oops, the went too far. Um, you can see the Paraset right down here. And if you get up close, you can see the antennas right underneath his hand. So here's after he worked 100 DXQ service. <laughs> Happy boy, with that Paraset, that would be a job, let me tell you. But he, sometimes he operated from, from, from buildings and homes even. Um, however, he's, he's using a straight key here. There is a key that's built into the Paraset, but we all know that that straight key is probably a lot better. They made a movie about this character. And uh, here he is in a building, uh, an out, outbuilding, uh, doing some reporting. So this is the story that's the important part to me anyway. So he starts out, he's 18 years old. He's in Norway. The Germans have just invaded and taken over his country. You're not happy about that, as you can well imagine. So he decides, I'm going to go to England and become a pilot. So he's got a buddy. They trade their motor, motorbike in for a boat. And this boat is uh, 18 feet long. 18 feet long with a little cabin on it. It's a day sailor. It's not meant to go across, across the North Sea. So he decides that the boat, they really need three guys so they can sail continuously day and night to get to England. So he... Um, leaves uh, Christian, Christian Sand here. Uh, and Oslo is up here, if you know where that's at. It's way, so he left basically from here. However, he did come down to Oslo, spent some time getting ready, getting the boat bought down in Christensen. So then he's got to sail all the way to, to England. And he's trying to get to London is where he's trying to go. But um, 
he gets caught by a German patrol boat right here. And he had some document, fake documentation that said he was a fisherman. The Germans bought it. Uh, and they let him go on. So as he traveled uh, across, he's doing pretty good. And he gets to about here and a gale comes up and it blows him all the way back to Denmark. It's a storm that won't end. And on top of it, this boat was a leaker. I mean, it leaked like crazy. I mean, they, they, are, they said, told in the book, they talk about, we bailed our way to London. And that's true. They just bailed, bailed, bailed and had terrible storms. They get caught a couple of times or investigated, but they finally make it down here to, to London. The, the Brits find him, they bring him in and eventually he gets into spy school. This took 20 days. He's in this boat and he had to have food, water, all, buckets, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is a little better picture uh, where Oslo is, where he started from. And when he was down here, we got dropped back into Norway. I forgot about that part. So he's in England, going to school, to train him, teaching him Morse code, spy craft of one kind or another. And then they got to take and drop him into country. So the two eggs on my plate story is that when these spy characters were going to go and be sent on a mission into country, they would breakfast that morning would be two eggs because they were hard to get. You could get powdered eggs, but you couldn't get real eggs. So they had, you know, five chickens that were busy over there, I guess, laying eggs. Um, so what did he do here? What he did here primarily was spent time, let's see, maybe the next map is better. Yeah, we'll go with this one. Um, his job was to look, watch this area here of the Christiansen Harbor. The submarine base, there was a submarine base here. Uh, and there was other shipping in and out. And his job was to report back to Bletchley on a daily basis. Not only weather, what ships were there, what they looked like they had on board, what he suspected they might be go doing, all of that stuff on a daily basis. So he had to get up in these mountains that are right here. If, if I go to this next picture, you can see this is pretty rugged territory. And he was looking basically down here was the harbor and he would be up in the mountains here. Now, the Germans, of course, had listening stations all over. So they had um, four of them. Let me go back here. He was here. Oops, I ah, got daggone buttons driving me crazy here. Um, he had, there were four, four listening stations that the Germans had. Here was one, there was one down here, one down here. So he kind of tried to operate in the middle. And he did that so in case he got intercepted that the other intercepting stations will say, well, it's the other German station over here. But he had to move a lot and they were out looking for him quite often. He, was, he had to move up here for a while and they chased him all over the place. Um, Here's another shot of the radio. This is what they took with him. He had to carry all of this stuff. These are mountains that he's climbing up and down. This is not, you know, for the faint of heart. Uh, all of this weighed about 38 pounds. And this is like field day in Norway. I mean, he had the radio. He had all these pieces. And, you know, you field day guys know what this stuff looks like. Uh, he had a battery. He had to carry the battery with him. Uh, that was just 38 pounds of mission equipment. And then he had food, all the other things that he needed to take with him. Here he is, you know, quite a few years later in a Lancaster bomber. Those suckers are only about this wide. I mean, it's amazing how narrow they were. And so they, in putting him in the country, they tried three times. And first two times he had weather problems. They couldn't see the drop zone for him. And, you know, when he went out, he went out with, big uh, mission con containers of other things, armor, guns, bullets, food, all different kinds of supplies. So he had to go through a little hole like where his feet are, and that's how he dropped out. Third time, the pilot was gonna turn back and he said, no, you're not, I'm going. I can't take this anymore. So they dropped him out and he landed and, and hurt his leg terribly and had to lay up for a few days. And 
And then he had no contacts in country. So he had to go develop his own contacts and figure out who are the good guys and who are the Germans, you know? So it was, it was sketchy for him. So these guys chased him all the time. So they had good stuff, you know, they got DF antennas up on top of these vans uh, and good equipment and good receivers. Uh, here's your typical Axis guy. You don't want him chasing you, I can tell you that. So electrically, it's a very simple radio. It's a, <laughs> a three tube receiver basically, or two tube receiver and a one tube transmitter. That's what you get, not much. Um, however, the voltages to build this thing are all known and they really, really went together quite well and worked well. But making some of these parts to make this as, as genuine and as, as close to the real thing as possible takes some time. Um, here it is when we're just beginning to get this radio put together. This is what it should look like. Um, finding dials was tough. That dial, I mean, you might be able to find one or two, but I needed six. And this is the tuning mechanism. It's just a friction veneer type of thing. Uh, you can kind of see this is just a regular knob with a, with a plate on the back, a copper plate that came that way. And then I had to uh, build up uh, this little piece here. And I'm gonna show you how we did that. There's a lot of people are using you know, the Japanese veneers to put these together. And I wanted something more authentic than that. So I needed to get the dial built and I needed to make the bushings that are behind that dial mechanism. So what did I do? I took a bolt, ground the top off, and then we drilled a hole through the center for the shaft to go through. And that worked slick. So that was the easy part. Uh, here it is, you can kind of see what it looked like, the, you know, the bolt and the, and the hole through the bolt at the end of the day. Um, getting this mechanism was, that was easier than I thought. Um, and I'm gonna tell you how that got done. I think that slides in here. But we had coil forms we had to build. Um, there was a little Morse code key that we built. This is, uh, through, you know, printed stuff, but it doesn't have to be that way. You could made this out of wood. Um, here is the design for the key. So this, all this key and all this information is out there on the internet, but I didn't know at the time how to make the contacts, these contacts for the key. So somebody told me, well, just take apart a relay, use those uh, silver contacts in a relay, and then solder them to this piece of brass. Boy, did that work. That works slick. And it didn't cost anything. I had, you know, we all got boxes of relays floating around. Uh, here is the drawing for it. And like I said, you, we made it out of plastic because one of the guys had that machine and was, wanted to help a lot. So we made the base out of plastic, but it could be made out of wood, it could be made out of lots of different kinds of materials. There's nothing magic about that thing. The, uh, this stuff, I just went to a hardware store, I went to Ace Hardware Store on down by me and picked up, you know, hobby brass and it works great. Um, if you don't want to build the key, you know, you can buy these things and put that in there if that suits your fancy. These are all over eBay, you see them all the time. So now that you had to make the front panel, well, all the drawings are there, you can make the front panel. We went to a, a place called Storm Steel in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and uh, they cut the panels out for us. And then we laid them all out. It's not hard to lay this out. You don't have to be super accurate, okay? And um, then they showed you some of the locations of the parts as yeah, kind of a X-ray view here, which was helpful in laying things out. Um, however, not all things work out the way you want. So we I found that using JB Weld to fill in you know, boo-boos works great, you know? It really does, and you know, nothing works like JB Weld in my mind for, a, for an epoxy. Uh, here it is all painted up and silkscreened. 
So how do we do that? Well, one of the gals that was involved in this has laid out the silk screen for us. And she, she had the silk screen made. And then we silk screened them and they looked beautiful. So it wasn't expensive to do this. So making the box, the box, you know, this guy, Greg Lind is a real good woodworker. And so he said, hey, I'm making the boxes for everybody. And he did, out of nice birch plywood and boy, they're beauties. There he is. Well, not only did the, dude, he did the box, but he did all these other little bits and pieces on his printer. Assembly, well, we've got all kinds of talent here, you know. Some of these guys are real characters, but they know how, they know how to build stuff. So he's all hopped up, ready to go. Yep. However, we have others that don't have much experience. So we had to spend a lot of time with some, training them how to solder. So we didn't take them to the hospital, you know? So. But you know, soldering is an important part of building anything. People forget that. It's not easy to, you know, soldering is a real talent. You gotta clean the parts. You use old parts, I use old parts, clean them. Those leads are credit up, some of them are 30 years old and they don't solder well when they're dirty. So take some alcohol, wipe the lead, get some of that uh, green, Abrasive stuff, clean that lead off. Clean your soldering iron. It, it pays off in so many ways. You get a solder joint that goes, oh, that one really looks like it's gonna work. This other one is blobbed up, you know, bubbly, not good. And um, so that's an important part of what we learned. We built this radio. I have very careful in what I select to build because some of the stuff you see is not fully formed, I think. Um, Sometimes the schematics you see have never even been built. So I decided that we should build this thing and kind of check it out as we went. So a friend of mine, Bob Ellis, I had him build the transmitter. Uh, and it's not much, as you can see. And we got five watts out. That's all you're going to get out of this thing, five watts. But, you know, we know it's, it's uh, plenty of signal. However, when you've got a, a regen receiver that's got two tubes in it, you need all the power input you can get out of those rhombic antennas at Bletchley. Uh, same thing on the receiver. We built the receiver up separate, just to make sure it all would all work before we started cutting metal and doing all those other things that we have to go do. Um, so this is the receiver that's, this one was in process. They're all done now. And what we plan to do with these things is do run a little operation of our own. So we'll have a Bletchley Park transmitter at my workshop with a good antenna. And we'll send those four guys out in different parts of town with five watts. This is, you know, 80 meters stuff. So we're not doing this. We're doing this during the daytime. Um, and we'll exchange messages and do one thing or another, but it'll be kind of fun to see how well these things work once really in the field with a, with a wire you throw in a tree. So what are we building now? We want to build a sideband transceiver for five bands. And this is based on this, the progressive receiver design of uh, W7ZOI. That design, receiver design has been in the handbooks for years. Um, we're going to build a, this is not originally, his receiver is a receiver. It's a typical super heterodyne, you know, uh, 75, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Collins kind of architecture, not much different. Uh, transmit function based on a 20 meter sideband design that, is, uh, that uh, he has in, in one of the QST magazines from quite a few years ago. His is 20 meters only, but I just need to add the switching for filtering, et cetera, and then this will, I think, will work fine. Uh, the receivers are built. This is the progressive receiver as W7ZOI and K5IRK originally designed it. Uh, very typical super head, nothing too magical about this. Um, it's really a 75 meter or an 80 meter receiver with converters in the front end. 
That's really what it is. We want to change the VFO because the VFO is set for 80 meters. So we're going to use a DDS. And here it is, the first implementation of this thing, of the receiver with a DDS. This is QRP Labs, a DDS. And I have bought five different Chinese DDSs that you see them on eBay. They all have problems. And I spent $250 on these things. Because I was looking, I wanted something with some graphics in it and you know, zip it up a little bit. But the only one I could really make work was the QRP Lab ones. Um, Here's another picture of it. This is a little later uh, build of the same thing. We have all the boards now in there. This one's got the VFO. What's different about this is one of the guys says, well, let's do this in surface mount. I can do that. You know, this is not easy, but we used uh, uh, 800, eight series parts in this, which is as small as you ever want to go. And these guys are mostly my age, you know, we're. Well, I'm 73 years old. Most of these guys are the same kind of age. Some of them have, you know, a little shake here and there, but they all made them work. Uh, we learned a lot. Now, we had these boards laid out using KiCad. I don't know if you know what KiCad is or not, but it is a super free uh, schematic tool, um, uh, simulation tool, and PC board layout tool. It's, it, there's a challenge in learning how to use it, but once you do, you'll love it. Uh, the boards were cheap. Um, I don't think we spent more than 30 bucks a board set from China. Now we ordered 10 board sets. I mean, not 30 bucks, $3 a board set. I mean, it was really cheap. Um, we, uh, here's one of the BFO boards. Here's a VFO board. Here's a pre-selector front end pre-selector board. Uh, here's the mixer board. Um, this one happens to be audio filter, sideband CW audio filter boards. But if this stuff looks interesting to you, and it's a step beyond building the kit, you're going to learn so much more doing it this way than by building kits. Kits have their place. I love them. I build them. But taking something from what you see in a magazine or in a handbook, and making it work and talking to people with it is, is a high that's hard to, hard to duplicate. It really makes you proud of yourself. It gives you something to, to talk to other people about. You can fix things a lot better. It's a great way to go. I mean, I, I, I believe that anyway. I have more people to want to be part of this community of five or six than I can put cars in my driveway, you know? So, we meet every, every Sunday afternoon, starting at one o'clock, going to about five, most of the time. Now, there are interruptions, you know, people get married, people go here, people go on cruises. And if I'm not there, this doesn't happen, of course, but for the most part, it happens every single Sunday afternoon. Um, and you develop, you get to learn from other people. You can learn from their mistakes, which is an important thing, of course. Then you learn from your own, which is just as important. And then there's the camaraderie of all of that. Just like you guys are all here, you know, you guys all have a lot of similarities and a lot of common elements. Some of you are more operator oriented than building oriented. I'm more building oriented than operating oriented. I mean, I've got high power amplifiers and, you know, six or eight radios that don't get used very often and those sorts of things. But the building thing keeps me going all the time. And as you get older, we all know this, you know, the things up here start going out the ear. So doing something that challenges your brain is a good thing. And it is not too hard to do, to do what I'll call pure home brewing. You just have to be patient, willing to, to work at it because it takes a lot of work, but start with a couple of guys, get your buddy together and, you know, have a brain fart, so to speak, and come up with something, but go have fun with this. Do it. You don't need lots of test equipment. You need some, and you probably, you guys probably have most of what you need now. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. No, oh, half an hour. No questions. You guys know all how to do this already. Huh? Good. 
Yes, sir. Well, of course he did. <laughs> you, know, you saw that receiver. There's nothing between, between the oscillator and the antenna. But that's why the Germans are out there all the time. And you guys probably know that when they would operate, when they would be DFing in cities, they would go and they would hear a signal. They didn't know exactly where it was. So they went to the power company and began shutting off power. And when the power went away, they had a good idea where the heck that stuff was, you know. I mean, there are, I've read a several different books about, you know, these agents that went into the country and some got caught real quickly and others hardly at all. There was one that was in Belgium and they had the antenna, you know, those mansard roof houses that had that big peak roof. They put the antenna up there and they never got caught. It was amazing. Uh, he was, the guy that owned the house was a member of, I don't know, the an important member of the community. Let me put it that way, you know, and, um, his daughter was blind, but she had exceptional hearing and she somehow could figure out where uh, the Germans were at. And she could walk around town any place, you know, with a cane and no one ever suspected her of doing anything that she shouldn't have been doing. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of books about this kind of stuff. This two eggs, in, two, uh, two eggs on my plate, you can buy it on eBay. It's seven, eight bucks, but it's really an interesting read. Uh, not only the use of the radio, but what these children, I'll call them children, 20 year old kids did. And they, these, this guy survived, as you can see, he's an old guy. Uh, at the end of the war, he got pulled out of Norway, of course. And, uh, but uh, it was tough on these guys. It was just amazing what they, what they went through. Okay. Breakdown? Oh, another one. Right? You can't see the lights behind you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, well, my, I could hear about minus 90 dB, okay, minus eight, minus 90, maybe at minus 100, but it was not the, the most sensitive radio, and it was real touchy, oh my gosh, it's regen, yeah, and I'm not, well, regen users know this stuff, see, I didn't know this about a regen, I'd never built one before, so everybody's worked, uh, we make cues with every single one of those radios, but I had to make cues. Well, another part of the story is I ran a CW class and I taught CW to, the, to some club members, uh, two of which came with me to start building radios. And so the CW class went two days a week, you know, for two hours a day. And these guys, people learned it. And there was about 10 people in that class, but they were not real good at it. But for graduation, you know, like Keith's group, they had to stand up in front of me and they had to take that radio and make a make a contact, a contact. And I gave them a good radio. They had a TS-940, they had a, a, a nice dipole on 40 meters in the evening. Uh, but some of them just, you know, talk about sweating. Yeah, that's it. That's, but they were all, they all got certificates. No, but there is a building contest. This guy, this is a story that is interesting. If I can go back up here. This one was built by a guy who'd never built anything before, so to speak. Well, I shouldn't say that. The first thing he built was an 811 PA. You know, the older handbooks had this 811 PA in it. And many of you guys probably built that thing. That's the very first thing he built. And it was beautiful. I mean, it, I was embarrassed to show my stuff compared to what he did. So then he builds this thing. And um, it all works perfectly. I mean, from what we can tell, it'll hear minus 110. So it's a it's, it's pretty hot receiver. It's got no RF preamp in it because it's an 80 meter receiver, but you, know, you get all that other gain and you need it on the other bands comes out of the converters. So, um, I'm real proud of him. I mean, this we built the, the, the you can see there's, well, maybe you can't see, but there's two crystal filters in here, one for sideband, one for CW. Uh, uses passive mixers, you know, these are SBL mixers, which are really, really good mixers. 
you know, it just doesn't have that active mixer. Overloads easily with active mixers. Um, the pre-selector, you know, this is uh, a, a, an 80 meter pre-selector just with the chromial tunable capacitor. We're gonna get rid of this as the VFO capacitor. We're gonna go with the DDS. Um, so what we, the hard part on the, you see a lot of DDSs, but a lot of them are only good for one band and they don't have any method to control the switching in them and uh, for different bands and all that stuff. And that's not what we need. So we need one to switch all five bands. And um, so we're really looking forward to the next piece of this. We'll build the companion transmitter over here on another board. So that's uh, what we know. I got one guy that doesn't build very, it doesn't solder well is the problem. I've had to go through and do a lot of uh, changes, soldering around and improve it uh, in order to get it to work. But this one works fine. That other one that I showed you here uh, really works nicely with that DDS in there. Um, this became the test board. This board here is the IF plus the filtering, the, the IF filter. I wanna try uh, this IF in here, see how well it works. Cause I know this one's got great AGC in here and that's half the battle. Hey, way back there. <laughs> right. Never picked it up, yeah. It's amazing what, these guys were chased in the woods, in the mountains for days, and they were away from where their camp is. You know, they'd make sure they draw them away as much as they can. Uh, but they would have, you know, 30, 40 Germans chasing them at times. So it was a tough life for them. And they had to move their camps uh, quite a few times, four or five times from what I recall. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a tough life. All right, oh, one more. Well, if you look back here, I guess I didn't do a very good job of explaining perhaps, but if we go back uh, to the, well, this guy wouldn't know. So <laughs> gotta go back to the beginning of this part and, and show you the maps so you can see what I what they did, um, they would be up in the mountains or on the top of the ridges. How you want to explain that? Looking down on the um, harbor, and they could see what boats were in the harbor, what ships were there, what submarines were there. They um, thought about uh, you know they looked at what they were on board these. Some of these were transport vessels. So, so they were up here at times, up here at times, up here at times, the harbor's down here. And so in this, this little swastika you see here is the harbor area. And so they would observe every day with binoculars what ships were there, the numbers, uh, ship numbers, uh, the kind of ship it was, what they had on board. And that's the information they would send back and they'd send back weather. You may recall that uh, the Tirpitz was up in a Norwegian fjord, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the material that came out of here that was going up, went up there uh, to support that ship. So it's kind of an interesting stuff. There's all kinds of inter interweaving stories. Yes. I just noticed <coughs> uh, across the bottom of the legend, ten kilometers. So if those guys were <coughs> Yes. Maybe four miles. Right. Well, but they were no, right. They transmit though. 
So they could DF on them and at least, you know, a couple of guys could kind of figure, well, they're kind of over here. So out come the troops, you know, to look for these guys. Now, it wasn't very far. It wasn't no, exactly. Exactly. They, they, they had a boat that was overturned upside down and they operated underneath the boat. The Germans never found them under there. And then they, had, well, they were on a, they had a cliff uh, that they would go down the cliff on a rope and they operated at the base of the cliff. They were almost undetectable there. So they uh, did lots of tough stuff. Some of them got hurt, and uh, but they all recovered. Okay, I've used up all your time. Thank you very much.